Thanks for having me. Yeah, we oh, can hear you, Lee. Hey. All right. Thanks for having me. Hey. I want to stay around, but I don't want to be a bad smell. So I'm going to no, pack no. off now. <laughs> well, I assume you need a break. I don't know how many hours you've been on. Oh, yeah. Tell me about it. Okay. See you guys later. Have a great session. Thank you so much, all of you. It's been amazing. And we're still at it for, I think, another 24 hours after this. See you later. Bye, Susie. See you later. Thanks for your work, Hello. Susie. Pleasure, pleasure to meet you, Vivian. A pleasure to meet you, too, Lee. Listen, you must introduce yourself because I'm afraid I crawled out of bed, slapped on some makeup, <laughs> and I haven't had a, t- I haven't had a chance to look up your bio. So, no, please, no worries. Introduce yourself. Introduce yourself. I uh, I host a uh, comedy news show on on RT America called Redacted Tonight. Uh, we're also popular on YouTube, and we've been going for about five years now. It's, uh, but it is, it is comedy news. We talk a lot about, we, we definitely talk about WikiLeaks. We use WikiLeaks work. Um, we talk about Assange and we talk about a, a lot of whistleblowers that have been persecuted in our society. Uh, you know, Edward Snowden and Chelsea Manning and, and the list goes on. I've had on whistleblowers that have been persecuted like, uh, John Kariaku, cause I also do a, a interview show. So, um, yeah, a lot of wonderful people, but yeah, the show is called Redacted Tonight. Uh, I've been a, Comedian and activist for 20 years. Wow. Gosh, you look very young. <laughs> started, <laughs> Unless you started, started at 10. <laughs> I did, yeah. I started stand-up comedy at 17. So. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, anyway. So, <laughs> shoot, on your most recent, because I'm sure that you watch Cassandra's, uh, I don't know if you saw it, actually, the Twitter where the WikiLeaks van turned up in front of the embassy and a guy with a bloody huge automatic weapon police officer came out i mean it was so over the top did you see that no when was that uh well it was a couple of days now but cassandra was monitoring the um is it ruptly the the guy that's gone out there and uh literally she put in her tweet, you know, oh my God, I just woke my child and my boyfriend up screaming because she saw all these guys turn up with a huge bloody automatic weapons. And it was just because this WikiLeaks van was parked outside the embassy. Well, I I mean, that shows how dangerous they view uh, freedom of press, freedom of speech. It's, they, they have really no other tools other than imprisonment and large weapons. So, you know, someone, (laughs) someone releases the truth and how do you deal with it? Well, you deal with it with the largest gun you can find. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. No, it, it is. And it's so different from England that I grew up in. Like there was just, you know, the police and they didn't have guns. They just would come up to you and say, excuse me, what are you doing, sir? You know, and right. it's gone from that to sort of, you know, I, I don't know, some kind of sci-fi. Actually, there was a really funny photo that I saw of a police officer with a thing on his back saying, um, oh, God, what was it? Uh it was something to the effect of, you know, um, politeness police or something. It was like, no, I'm serious. It was like some guy who was telling people to be polite and behave themselves. And it was actually on his back. I have to find it and retweet it. It was ages ago. It was absolutely insane. I mean, you know, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, well, the, the, the UK police are now trying to mimic the militarization of the US police. And, yeah. uh, you know, luckily, the number of police killings in the UK hasn't gotten anywhere near what it is in the US. In the US, it's often, a, it's usually a thousand or more a year. In the UK, mm-hmm. police kill, you know, like 10 to 15 a year. So it's a, it's a big difference. Yeah, well, look, America is still the Wild West, no matter what people imagine. The British culture is just, just ancient. And people mm-hmm. have figured out a way of talking to each other. I mean, you know, the famous British good manners, right? And uh, <laughs> I think, no, seriously, I think that the closest I've ever seen that uh, is in New York, where police officers come up and say, come on, lady, what are you doing? Can you stop doing that? You know, they're just a little bit more reasonable and a little bit less officious. But I think this militarization, sorry, I'm. You know, oh, no, it's, it's I fine. Am the I was the worst, worst chatterbox. So just no, no, no. You're, 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 <laughs> you're wonderful. I was just going to say though that, that this is uh, what you're saying is another reason that uh, Julian Assange should not be extradited to the United States. 
Uh, you know, we have the largest prison state in the world, the largest you know, prison industrial complex. We, uh, you know, are, are known recently for our torture of completely innocent people in Guantanamo Bay. Often those people, many of them are still in Guantanamo Bay, even though multiple courts have said they're completely innocent and need to be released and we just don't release them. So, you know, why would you extradite someone who's so-called guilty of publishing something that is done by all the mainstream media outlets. I mean, Washington Post published the Pentagon Papers, so did New York Times, a leaked document by Daniel Ellsberg. So they are guilty of the same, quote unquote, guilty of the same thing Julian Sons has done. And yet he's going to be sent to the nation, you know, extradited to the nation that is known for imprisonment, known for torture. Yeah, well, I think it's a bit obvious. Julian is incredibly effective. You know, anybody who is super effective, you know, in other words, they'll pay lip yeah. service to freedom of speech and a free press, but the second somebody gets their head a little too close, then they chop it off. And, uh, but I, I'm very curious to know what you think about, uh, because this is a very important area that I'm very worried about, is this, what I think, and Susie was saying, um, that QAnon, is very, very, very suspect. It feels, mm. it smells and smacks of a psyop. And yeah. what do you feel about these people? Because I get tweeted by people from QAnon all the time saying to me, oh, Q says it's totally safe and don't worry because when he gets to America, he'll just be kissed on the forehead and chatted to and then set free. Um, how, you know, that it's part of the plan. This is the, I'm sorry for everybody who's into Q. I know I've just deeply insulted you, but I really am just trying to keep it light. I actually am really worried about this QAnon. I think it is a giant. Oh, oh I'm sorry. My dogs are trying to kill each other. Can you stop? <laughs> no. I, I okay. agree with you. I mean, I, I haven't paid that much attention to, to, to it. I mean, I do here and there, but I, I think the, the idea that, uh, you know, Trump wants the best for all of us and he's just a master uh, chess player is, is hilarious to me. Um, you can look at his life before he became president to see he's no master chess player. And uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's so I think a lot of what's being said by QAnon is just laughable. Uh, yes, I think that they there is absolutely an effort to get Julian Assange. There's no effort and there's really been no effort shown by the U.S. government to want to mm -hmm. help Assange or set him up to be free. Um, you know, if, if that were their goal, they could have done that long ago. It would have been simple for them to uh, to make him a free man, not to propagandize against him, not to, uh, you know, try and malign his name and everything else. And, you know, as uh, Susie was saying in the last one, George Galloway asked people whether they support him. And, and I hope that most do. But if there are some people watching who say who, 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 you know, you'll see people say, well, yeah, but he he tweeted things I didn't like or he didn't he didn't he do something. The answer is a with the tweets who gives a fuck. All right. If someone tweets mm -hmm. something you don't like, that doesn't mean you imprison them for life or extradite <laughs> them to the U.S. to be tortured. That doesn't make any logical sense. And mm -hmm. and. Secondly, no, all the charges have been dropped against him. It's, yeah, so I, all the arguments against why he should be continually imprisoned don't hold up. Well, yeah, let's refresh. The man hasn't committed any crimes. Right. Trump's actual attorney, Rudy Giuliani, went on Fox News and said, Julian Assange has committed no crime. It is exactly the same as the Pentagon Papers. The New yeah. York Times, under these ideas, would have had to have gone to prison. It's completely unacceptable. So Rudy Giuliani is the president's attorney. I know things, and I know you know too, no attorney is going to speak in that way unless he knows the president agrees with him, which is why Joe uh, um, Laurie wrote like an immediate instant um, article on that particular broadcast. Now, last night, um, I was speaking to Jack uh, Posobiec, and he said seven months ago, he discovered that uh, Trump was actually uh, trying to negotiate a deal with Assange because, like we were saying, this is planet Earth. Trump is not going to give away um, Julian Assange by just pardoning him. He's going to want to make a deal or at least to placate, placate the Secret Services. Right. They're going to want some kind of deal from him, which is fair enough. You know, I don't think. I think uh, Jack was saying that um, if Julian was to 
provide the service of saying, look, these are where your loopholes are in your security, um, you know, in your cybersecurity and, and help them in that way, that that would be the deal and that he would be released. But that James Comey, when he got wind of this deal, he killed it. And mm -hmm. he just said, absolutely no way. Um, and I don't know what kind of, you know, situation the president finds himself in, but I suspect that he certainly is not the one calling the shots on many things like um i'm sorry i'm babbling away here because i want you to comment on what you no no you're, ma you're making you're making a great point which is whether you, whether people out there love trump or hate him uh he doesn't make the decision on everything and even when he makes certain decisions for example he said he was going to pull all the troops out of syria he then told the pentagon to prepare for pulling out of syria and then the opposite ended up happening nine days later we were sending more troops in and you know basically bombing syria so Trump doesn't, he, he makes, yes, he can make certain decisions and he can put certain pressures on, but no president makes every decision. And there is the entire, basically, U.S. government that wants Julian Assange's head for revealing the truth behind our government, how it works, how it functions, the cables that are sent, the uh, collateral, uh, you know, killing in, in Iraq, those kind of things. Um, and they all want him, they all have it out for him. So, it's it just seems like there there is nothing that the us is going to allow that's going to be positive for julian assange it it really needs to come from a kind of groundswell grassroots movement where they're more afraid of continuing to imprison him than they're afraid of what he you know uh, might might uh, reveal or something yeah actually that sorry i keep like big fan of jack uh's interview last night because he said some really great things but um Jack also uh, was, um, oh God, now of course my brain's going, but uh, Jack and I were talking about how if President Trump actually just said, okay, I'm going to uh, make it that the big tech companies can no longer um, censor people, that he would then garner a huge following. But I also said, well, he would also garner a huge following if he actually went through and not just halfway about fake news like it's it's very suspect if he goes on and on about fake news which we all know it is and the american people or most of them know it's fake news and it's bullshit and it's propaganda and everything if he was to go the next step and say and in testimony to my disgust at fake news i want something like wikileaks and i've i've tweeted that to trump before i said you need wikileaks you say you want to drain the swamp you're going to need somebody to help you with that because the yeah. swamp sure isn't going to like go. Okay, all right, we're the swamp. Come and get us. Um, so, what do you what do you think about what Trump might do and 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 how it might well, actually work favorably for him? I mean, my my opinion on Trump are things like when he says things like "I'm going to drain the swamp." It's all BS because he then surrounds himself with Citibank and and Goldman Sachs. If you look at his economic advisors. So they're all, it's more swamp, you know, he's, he's brought in more swamp to replace the old swamp. So. All right. Now, wait, 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 wait. Cause I've really got to challenge you on this. Sure. Isn't sure. It, isn't it very, very possible that he's got absolutely no control over get over who gets put in? Like, isn't it possible no, he's, that he's, he's sitting, proven his, he's proven his control over who gets in his cabinet. Well, you see, I have this idea that there are people that are cutting deals with him constantly saying, we need this guy in. If you don't let this guy in, we're not going to let you do this. Like I, my imagining, my, my imagination tells me that the president is totally hogtied in terms of doing what he really wants to do. And I think he must have to cut deals constantly with these people. I mean, you were saying he said, let's pull out of Syria. And nine days later, it was being bombed. So, I mean, how much power does he really have? Right. I think I think he has power on certain things and not on others. But, you know, if you look at Trump's past before presidency, it's not like he was anti Wall Street. So Goldman Sachs and them are, you know, why would he want to drain the swamp if he didn't want to drain the swamp before in his life? Um, mm. He put in Goldman Sachs and started in charge of the economy and giant tax cuts for the rich is kind of his it makes sense. It fits with his life. But anyway, I think mm. I think w whether you and I agree on that doesn't really matter. Uh, no. uh, I think what we what we need to agree on and what we do agree on is is the importance of uh, Julian Assange of WikiLeaks and the importance of his freedom. So, you know, whether Trump controls the decision or not, 
I think the extradition of Assange to America is would be a terrible thing, and he would not receive fair treatment here in any way. No, he wouldn't. And I think that it, I, that's what I think about the QAnon people. As I said, why do you think that magically the deep state is just going to disappear? You know, <laughs> I mean, exactly. what? It's all part of the plan. Julian comes to America and the deep state just magically vaporizes. And so he's not in danger. <laughs> you know, that's just right. not real. I, and I right. do and, want and to say even, something. Oh, and Sorry. even some of the, I, you know, the higher ups on both sides. So like Hillary, Pompeo, they've all said basically they want to kill Assange. I mean, Hillary talks mm -hmm. about drone bombing. Pompeo talked about mm -hmm. killing him. So it's, mm -hmm. it's really almost the entirety of the U.S. government that wants him like assassinated. Yeah, the knives are drawn and there's certainly no um, bones made about that from the people that want him absolutely flayed. But, you know, this was, again, something I talked to Jack about because he is a naval, he was a naval intelligence officer and an analyst. And he said that because I asked him about Gina Haspel, you know, I mean, it's a bit discouraging if someone who's got a nickname like Bloody Gina is now the head of the CIA, which is another, yeah. like, you know, yeah, I yeah. don't think. Oh, okay. Um, I don't fun, think. Fun, that... fun fact about Gina Haspel oh, yeah. and uh, the, yeah. the only person to ever serve time in jail for mm. the U.S. torture program is the guy who revealed the torture program, John Kariaku, who's been on these right. vigils before. And, yeah. and I mean, how hilarious is that? And then one of the overseers of the torture program is now the head of the CIA. So you do the torture, you're promoted, you reveal the torture, you go to jail. Yeah, I mean, this, this is so discouraging. I, I, I hardly need to, I hardly can process how they are so brazen about something like this. Actually, what, what would you, what would you say if, if if Julian and WikiLeaks hadn't revealed what they revealed to us? Do you think that most people would still be thinking that there's a benevolent force looking after the world? Uh, I, I mean, it's quite possible. I last time I was on here, I talked about how how the ripples of what WikiLeaks has revealed go through mm -hmm. so many things that you don't even think about their connection. I mean, without WikiLeaks. Uh, helping and facilitating in terms of the information people had and the awareness they had of our society. You likely wouldn't have seen the Arab Spring. You likely wouldn't have seen Occupy. You likely wouldn't have seen uh, even the Bernie Sanders movement or the, the Trump movement in terms of the people working, waking up in, in various ways about the reality of our, our world. I mean, it just ripples through so much. You wouldn't have seen uh, the U.S. pull out of the TPP. Um, it, it honestly, it just, it, it ripples through everything. The awareness of how rigged our election system is in the U.S., not just the primaries, but the general as well, and how pathetic our entire election system is. Uh, that, that, some of that goes back to, to WikiLeaks as well. So it, it is just, uh, it ripples through everything that people now know about how our system works. And it's very rarely given credit for a lot of these things. Uh, which is extraordinary. I mean, it, it, it also, I mean, you talk about, well, uh, I think that the main point is that WikiLeaks and Julian Assange have probably turned the world around in, in, in the same way that Edward Snowden did. In fact, if no one comes forward again, I, I think we're in much less danger now because of what Edward exposed and what Julian has exposed. Like those two men, and the people that worked with them and helped them have changed the world and the direction we were heading in. And I think that, you know, I've often said that we're gonna need WikiLeaks, uh, but I think if WikiLeaks disappeared, if Julian Assange disappeared, um, if they do that, they're setting themselves up to make an army of Julian Assange's and an army of WikiLeaks. And they may, need, they may not be as effective or good, at redacting and being careful with the material, but I just think that they're going to, they, they need to calm things down and they need to release Julian in order for, sorry, for it to not turn into just some huge mm -hmm. reaction. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I, I think, I mean, I think that's part of the reason they're in such a jam right now is that they, mm -hmm. 
they have him imprisoned, but they don't technically have him in prison, so they can act like, oh, we're not harming him, but of course he is he is in a prison, his health is failing, um, and, and it's really no different than prison, other than I'm sure there's some torture the U.S. could come up with uh, if they were to get him extradited. But you mentioned Snowden, you know, let's also give credit to Assange and WikiLeaks for uh, ensuring Snowden ended up with some freedom in Russia, he would he he very well without their help uh, the lawyers and such would have uh, ended up um, you know in in solitary confinement in the U.S. for the rest of his life. So it, it, again, the, you know Julian Assange and WikiLeaks were there to uh, help whistleblowers those who are courageous enough to come for, forward. Uh, you know their campaign to to free Chelsea Manning uh, was just nonstop and they you know succeeded. She's She's being, uh, she's a political prisoner yet again right now, but uh, hopefully that, that won't last forever. No, sorry, my dogs are trying to kill each other, so I'm a bit distracted. Hang on a sec, stop it. Maybe the dogs um, just want to get in on the call here. Maybe they're big uh, Well, they, 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 they do, and that's the problem is there's too many up on here. There's three of them, and they're <laughs> fighting for the space. I've got one on either side. Anyway, he's going to sit on my lap, and if there's a sudden dog fight, you'll uh, be able to deal with it. Um, I'm <laughs> really enough. curious. I'm really curious. If you had the chance to speak to Gina Haspel, and you were to try and soothe her, and, and I don't mean this in a funny way. I mean, soothe her into understanding that she's trying to, let's pretend that Gina wants to protect America. And... Like Kevin Ship says, do you know Kevin Ship? He's former CIA. Kevin Ship. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, he said that they call everybody in the CIA calls the CIA the paranoia palace. So let's say that what really needs to happen, and you know, I don't know if you are big on you know Secret Service novels or stories or even the history of it, but. Basically, everybody is triple double crossing and, and they have an angle on everything and you can't trust anyone, right? Mm -hmm. Hence, Paranoia Palace. So let's pretend that all of these people genuinely want um, good things to happen to America. How would you explain to Gina from the other side of a person who is a citizen of America why it is more important to protect the First Amendment, why it is more important to protect Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, because ultimately, the thing that's going to take America down is corruption, not other countries. So I'm curious if you had the chance to speak to Gina and you were to reason with her and to try and encourage them to know that Julian is an important person in the world, what would you right. say? Right. Well, it is trust, tough to reason with a sociopath, but uh, I guess I'd <laughs> say that the... <laughs> the, the the most of the people at the CIA, uh, even the ones mm -hmm. and and our various intelligence agencies, even the ones probably doing the most harm, probably think they're doing it or tell themselves they're doing it to protect America. They're protecting America against Julian Assange and against WikiLeaks. And here's the thing: if you're protecting America, what are you protecting? Well, you're protecting. You know, they claim to protect the 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 Constitution or the rights and freedoms that are insured within. I mean, that is kind of the core of what the biggest patriots say about America is protecting those that you know that document and the and the rights and freedoms there. So, what are the you know the key rights and freedoms? have to do with freedom of speech and freedom of press and freedom of assembly. And it's everything that Julian Assange and WikiLeaks are exercising. It is the freedom to publish documents that come out that show the truth about our uh, corporate state. It is, it is you know, the, the, the freedom to tell the world what's going on there, to reveal that we are committing crimes, war crimes on a massive scale around the world, to show the public that is supposed to be, we're, right, we're supposed to be in charge of our government. We're supposed to, supposedly, we elect them and we, and we decide whether they're fit to govern. I mean, they're supposed to represent us and yet there's so much we don't know. We're supposedly not allowed to know. The amount of secrecy is incredible. And they just hide everything under national security. And so revealing those, those, that information about why we're doing what we're doing for, for at real, the actual reasons, not the bullshit political reasons, is, is telling the American public what they need to know to make informed decisions, to make informed votes. So, so to show us that you know, we are executing Iraqi civilians and it just as revenge, collateral murder, and, and uh, you know, two of those were Reuters journalists, 
it, it, it that type of thing, that type of information is crucial, crucial for the American people to to learn in order to uh, continue to have representatives that actually represent us. So if you aren't protecting those freedoms, if you aren't protecting those rights, then you're not protecting the core of what you, you know, you being a, 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 the CIA or FBI being a real patriot, what you claim to be protecting, you're not protecting at all. So that's brilliant what you just said. And if you were to now continue on this idea of speaking to Gina, because I really think this is important because I'm sure the CIA is going to watch. <laughs> I'm um, sure we have a few viewers out there. Hi, CIA. <laughs> yeah, no, and hi, you know, if you love America, you need to listen to the people because that is the fundamental basis. So continuing on and speaking to the CIA for yourself, getting your chance to speak to them. What would you say from the other side, right? Would you say something like, I would say, hey, I don't mind if we as a country have to do, you know, battle with terrorists or whatever. I would, but what I don't want is to have a society that's a pretend, unreal, um, you know, spoon fed society. That's a very weak society because that basically doesn't allow human beings to help, right? Help make mm -hmm. it a wonderful country so if you were speaking to the cia and you were advising them based on being an american citizen based on understanding the values that are in the constitution how would you say that you think their job should be because basically they're meant to analyze everything from around the world and tell that to the president they're not meant to analyze things around the world and then just operate as a black covert secret behind seven thousand curtains operation uh, which it's turned into. So what would you say the CIA's job should be? And how would yeah, that connect I mean, to I think, Julian? I mean, how would that right. connect with Julian? Because it I, I seems think, to me. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think that it's understandable that like if you a CIA person or an FBI person or something would say, well, we have to redact certain things because we have to cover up our sources and we have to, uh, you know, there's certain state secrets that can't be known by the public. I get that they would say that, but we now live in a, a basically completely secretive uh, government that is not at all even slightly accountable to the society as a whole we have no idea what they're what they're doing there's 21 trillion dollars unaccounted for adjustments at the pentagon alone over the past 20 years which is an unfathomable number of uh, amount of money and and we i mean oh snowden revealed that the entire U.S. populace is being surveilled on a level that no one knew about, that no one had any idea about. And it's like, that is not a government accountable to the people. That is a full-on surveillance state that is lying to the American people and saying it is, it, we're, we're protecting you from foreign enemies. Well, no, you're surveilling us. You're trying to, quote unquote, protect yourselves from the American people, from the actual idea of democracy, from the actual idea of representative democracy. It, it, so honestly, it, it's basically like a dark coup that has taken over our government. Um, you know, and large studies have proven this. There's a there's a large Princeton study that showed that the American people have no uh, uh, impact on what laws actually get passed anymore um, in unless something aligns with corporate interests, nothing ever gets through Congress that is simply for the American people. Meaning basically we've lost control of the government. And so I would encourage uh, all those within the intelligence community and within the government, which is you know hundreds of thousands of people, I would encourage them to think about what they're really fighting for. I mean, look at the things Edward Snowden has written about why he did what he did. He didn't do it because he's trying to hurt America. He did it because he was a patriot of the true sense of the word. He was trying to tell the American people about the reality of their situation and allow them to retake their government, to retake their society, to, to, to be the deciders on how our society works and whether we all want to be surveilled at this level. And Julian Assange is, is, has done the same with all the revelations uh, that have come out through WikiLeaks. So honestly, even though Julian's not American, these, that's, that's what 
patriotism is. It is making the country better by revealing the reality of the situation, not hiding everything from the actual American populace and uh, you know, treating them like some sort of enemy combatants that need to be watched and imprisoned. Like I said earlier, we're the largest prison state in the world, um, and it, both by both per capita and by number. And it's it, so, yeah. It's it's like that. If you really want to help a country, you should reveal to the people the reality of their world. Yeah, I think that was fantastic. That's exactly true, and I think the more that people take up i mean this is again you know like my example is i think jesus christ for instance i don't think he wanted people to worship him they he wanted people to raise their consciousness to be at his level and i think that yeah. julian assange i compare them because i think julian he's trying to raise human consciousness so when you know you talk about patriotism let's talk about mankindism you know why can't we be uh, for mankind and Julian mm. is for mankind why why shouldn't CIA be for mankind I understand it, it's so, you it's humankind now but yeah uh, okay oh sorry uh <laughs> womankind I mean. yes exactly <laughs> um, yeah um but I, I, I I'd love you to just work in because I'd like them to think about this the value of someone like Julian Assange and WikiLeaks because remember, he didn't just expose America. He's exposed Russia. He's exposed all kinds of countries. Yep. And, you know, they may have very effective spy rings, but there's nothing quite like the actual documents or indeed an insider who has access to them. I mean, I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but the uh, CIA had a whole psychic division where they were having psychics teach CIA agents to do remote viewing. Have you ever heard of this? Do you know oh what yeah, there was a there was a fun, there was right. a funny movie done about this. I think, but yeah, <laughs> but the Russians were doing it too. And yeah. the thing is, I, I I think that what's so interesting about this is it sort of comes down to like if the mush if the Martians landed, right? It would be mankind against the Martians. So I just say, why don't Gina Haspel and everybody in the CIA realize that really ultimately they need to work for mankind because that's what will bring security, and that's the joke. They're creating insecurity for America. They're creating factual cyber insecurities. Sorry, so I'd love you to riff on. Well, well, like that. like you said earlier, they are they are paranoid of the highest sense. They are not working for humankind. They are working to ensure American dominance over all others. Um, and I think that they're getting scared because, uh, thanks to technology and information going worldwide. It's uh, America can't maintain this level of, of empire. We can't, can't maintain the economic uh, dominance when we have, you know, have no manufacturing base anymore. So in order to maintain that dominance, they have to do it via try and control information and try and militarily control uh, everywhere around the world. We have a, 800 to 1,000 military bases around the world. Meanwhile, you know how many Russia has outside of Russia? Ten. No. Okay. <laughs> And, and most of those are in uh, former Soviet Union countries. So mm -hmm. it is a tiny, minuscule number. China has one military base outside of China. And when they placed that one, I can't remember which country, but when they created that one, the U.S. freaked out. There were speeches from, you know, State Department officials saying, China's trying to take over the world because they have their one military base. We have a thousand, and it, it's just, it's completely disgusting. It's unfeasible. It's it, the, the military uh, empire dominance around the world is, it's not good for, like you're saying, a uh, unity of humankind. It's only good for dominance. It's only good for, for death uh, and destruction and a death economy. We have a death economy. We have to c maintain war. We have to maintain the amount of money we spend on weapons contractors, the amount of weapons we send to countries like Saudi Arabia, creating a genocide in Yemen. We have to maintain that stuff because of the money that's in, in, in it. You know, it used to be that war profiteering was illegal and now war profiteering is half our economy i mean it's it's totally revolting and mm. we need to make a shift to a peace economy and that's only going to happen if people have this information if they know the truth about all these secretive projects and and secretive decisions that are being made and that information has 
largely only come out through WikiLeaks and a few other select uh, whistleblowers. Uh, absolutely. And in fact, you're making me think about another aspect of military dominance, which is the horrific indoctrination practices in boot camps, you know, mm -hmm. to get men and women at this point to kill. And yep. if you look at the training in the military, they're trained literally to be sociopathic. And actually, on that note, years ago, when, CIA, when the CIA had a internet site that was pretty like innocent, really, when I think about it, they actually had the application form online, uh, the questionnaire to join the CIA. And I read through it and it was literally like, if you want to weed out all the normal people and end up with sociopaths, then you get high marks on this questionnaire. And I think that yeah. it would be very, very, very important for people to, in the military, to really start to question their actual jobs, their roles. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I recently had on uh, my show, Redacted Night, I had on Matthew Ho, who works for Veterans for Peace, but he did three tours or four tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. And until he uh, realized that what he'd done there was not helping the people, was not uh, saving them, it was just harming and killing. And uh, he, the way he described, you know, you, you talk about the indoctrination, he said, once we come out of the service and we, you know, kind of, for those of us that lose the indoctrination and, and let it go, we realize we've suffered extreme moral injury. Uh, mm. Basically, their, their sense of morality and their sense of, of morals have been, have been crushed and pushed aside, which is the training. The training is you, you don't worry about that stuff and you only worry about protecting your brothers and sisters on the quote unquote battlefield. But, uh, you know, once you. Well, once and you following a, orders. Yeah, following yeah, orders, following right? the orders. You know. God help yeah, us. but once you take a, a step back, and that's why so many of these men and women come home uh, after service, quote unquote, which, you know, that term needs to change, but uh, come home and they they are crushed individuals. They either end up uh, severely depressed, roughly 25 a day, kill, kill themselves, and mm -hmm. uh, it, it, they severely depressed. They can't really function in society, many of them. They're obviously not taken care of by our government, which is a whole other story, but uh, it, it is war is crushing, it, and you know, and I obviously haven't been in war, but I've read books from uh, from people who have, and and people who are war journalists, and it is a, a disgusting horror show, and should be a a final choice, a last a last ditch effort to try and uh, you know protect uh, something, but. It right the way we use it right now, it's just a daily effort. We drop hundreds of bombs from drones every single day, and there's hardly even an understanding of um, what the who those are really killing. Uh, you know, they they see a grainy target on a uh, on a screen uh, from Las Vegas. The pilots drop a bomb, and they don't know who they're killing. They're even according to the Pentagon's own numbers, 98 percent of drone bombings kill innocent civilians, and the, you know those are. Uh, innocent civilians and they they sometimes they call those enemy combatants but that's just because they say anyone in a strike zone is an enemy combatant um and that's ridiculous of course because enemy combatants are also with families and villages and everything else and according to their own numbers a federal study showed that terrorism has gone up five times as much since the beginning of the war on terror since we started doing this so yeah. it's not actually stopping terrorism, it's creating it. Because if you're in a town where bombs rain down, you become furious, you become violent, you, you, you end up a, a part of this. And so, and, and a lot of this information that I'm talking about right now, again, uh, a lot of it's thanks to WikiLeaks uh, or other whistleblowers. Right, so how are we going to, as a group of beings, understand, because this is true, that Julian is an example to us uh, on how to actually be as a human being. And I know that everything is working against people from doing that because I don't think it's any coincidence that there's a combination of overwhelm, of being constantly having to be working uh, to make enough money, uh, constantly distracted by rubbish and bullshit and fed unending social engineering. In fact, if anyone hasn't watched it yet. There's a, a documentary, interestingly, a BBC documentary 
uh, called The Century of the Self. Have you ever heard this? Of this yeah, it's excellent. Yeah, it's excellent. Isn't it brilliant? Um, so that uh, to understand that each one of us, just like my analogy of saying, you know, Julian is like Christ. Christ wanted us to raise our consciousness up to his level. Julian needs us, even if we don't want to. He needs us to raise ourselves up to about his level. Uh, I mean, you know, not an expertise or anything, but in, in the level of wanting truth. And, you know, how much you want truth, this becomes like a very deep, you know, spiritual, evolutionary, civilization quest. If we don't aim for truth, we're going to be in trouble. I mean, it's really that simple. And the truth, for instance, for the military, when you go into the military, I mean, my father made, I think, a very good film on that Full Metal Jacket, where it yeah, shows you- Yeah, you, you, you did work on that, didn't you? I did yeah. the music, yes. Yeah. Um, I think he showed the agony of being basically turned into an unthinking monster and um, and then that crisis of him having to, you know, shoot this little girl, basically. And in fact, that was true. You know, they had a lot of just young little kids uh, who were snipers. Um, and I, I just think that it's a bit like in the 1960s. Do you remember in the Vietnam period, they had all those women putting flowers in the ends of guns and stuff like that and saying if they gave a war and nobody came. You know, mm -hmm. in a way, if the military men and women just went, you know what, this is wrong. We're not going to fight. What are they going to do? I suppose they just use all their, I mean, I'm sure, actually, that's probably why they're getting into all these horrendous killer bots. Um, I'm sure you've seen those. Yeah. 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 Because the, I guess they, sorry. I'm well, a yeah, terrible, I mean, terrible chatterbox. I'm sorry. No, no, you, you, I, I think you're doing a great job. Uh, and you're bringing up such great uh, topics. But um, the, that, they're, they are running out of, of men and women to get to do a lot of this stuff. Uh, and so they have, you know, for years now, decades now, the U.S. has resorted to various kinds of pressure to get people to sign up for the military. Uh, a lot of it is paying for college. And, you know, it's like, it, it's it's it, 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 if if you have to join the military, if you decide to kill or be killed in order to afford college, that doesn't that's not noble. That means that college is too fucking expensive. Like <laughs> this isn't something we should celebrate. Like oh, that person was economically forced into being a killer. That like that that's not something that should be celebrated. That's something that should be very sad, and we should look at it as very sad. Um, and I, I think you're right. A, a lot more people are kind of realizing the the indoctrination that goes on and how, how difficult it is. And, uh, you know, and that doesn't mean some people don't a certain percentage don't join up for the right reasons. But I think a lot of them begin to realize that those may have been the right reasons, but the things we're actually being asked to do don't feel right. They don't morally feel just. Like you're going into some country that you don't understand and you're being asked to uh, kill people you don't understand for reasons that seem a little vague or seem a little odd, you know, like we're, we're going into Iraq and for weapons of mass destruction that aren't there and, and you know, the truth comes out and then we're just going to stay in that country for tens of years afterwards and, and you know, Afghanistan and, and a lot of soldiers and uh, realize that afterwards, you know, or sometimes during it, that why are we here? What are we doing? What are we accomplishing? Are any of these people, are any of these villages, do they feel they, that we've brought them democracy? Do they feel that we've brought them freedom? No, it's it's laughable. And meanwhile, the U.S., and some of this has been brought forward by WikiLeaks as well, the U.S. is propping up uh, you know, they're, they're, they're funding Al Qaeda affiliates. They're giving arms to Al Qaeda affiliates. We're, we're, we're basically funding and propping up both sides of our battles uh, because, you know, instability in that region is just good for us in general. So, uh, you know, Syria falling into a, a kind of terrible state is in a, in a way a victory for the United States government because just having uh, Syria not be stable and not be strong is fine. And they think nothing of the innocent civilians that die throughout all of this, you know, hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children. And then we act like we do care uh, about innocent civilians when it's done by someone else. Uh, 
um, you know, and you talked about the, 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 the children that are, that are often involved in these things. Uh, you know, right now we're seeing the Great March return with Palestine and, and hundreds of people have been shot by snipers that, that these people are unarmed. They often have press or uh, other things and they're, and they're still shot. And half of all Palestinians in, in Gaza are children, are under 18. So this is an assault on largely children. And the U.S. is, of course, uh, involved in that as well, very heavily. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of this information is coming out uh, or has come out in the past, thanks to WikiLeaks and thanks to Julian Assange. And, and you were talking about raising uh, people up. I, I think that hopefully uh, Assange and Snowden and Chelsea Manning and some others serve as an example of just an amazing amount of courage. Uh, it's an amount of courage that I... I find hard to even grasp at times, the willing to sacrifice your freedom, sacrifice your, your life in some instances to reveal the truth to the world about what is going on, about this uh, horrible state of affairs. And it, it doesn't seem like, uh, you know, that, that it's being done for other reasons. It really seems like it's being done out of a, a, <clears throat> out of a need for, for truth and a need for, uh, 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 information to be free. I, th I think what you just said was so powerful, and all it kept make me. It, I, I just kept thinking, how can how can you and I unpack something here that's very very, I think, lost on most people? Which is why are we involved as America, right? But I don't think it's the American people or even the American government. There's something else going on here in all these wars, right? We're not we're not bombing Tahiti. We're not bombing Fiji. We're not, you know, um, blowing up, uh, you know, Mongolia. So yeah. what is it about these places that America wants to dominate? Why or not America, because I'm going to get specific here. None of the American people, I don't believe for a second that American people are going brilliant. Let's get in there and bomb everyone. Right. So there's obviously something else behind this. And I would say, if I was to draw a conclusion based on observation. This is a colonialism. This is like the British, you know, going into China and making everyone heroin addicts or opium addicts. This is like a takeover for resources, for dominance in a marketplace. And mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm thinking of uh, Eisenhower's 1961 speech you know where he's when he was leaving office and he said yeah. hey watch out everyone you know watch out for the military industrial complex even though it was him that actually created it which is really like his conscience obviously preyed on him but right. what do you what do you think like because this is the thing you can either stop someone by grabbing them by the throat and poking their eyes out or you can just say to them would you mind just stopping for a second right and they probably will so obviously what we're talking about here is force versus reason. So obviously there are people behind these arms deals, this uh, going into countries and blowing the shit out of them. You know, why aren't they blowing the shit out of Fiji? Because there's nothing on Fiji that American corporations want. So yeah. I guess I'm sort of like trying to wheedle in my little idea, yeah. which is that it's corporations behind the military industrial complex saying, go into that country, blow the shit out of it because we want to go in there and get the resources or do something. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right. I mean, there's, there's mainly three things that, uh, that I'd say connect at least some or all of these countries that we get involved in. Uh, it's resources. Often it's oil. It's oil is still very powerful. I know people say oil is on the way out, but it's still very uh, powerful and, and, and a lot of money still in oil. So, you know, right now, th that's why we're trying to, uh, to destroy Venezuela is to get at their oil reserves. Um, and there could be other resources. There's uh, rare earth metals in, in Afghanistan. So there are other resources we want. But uh, and and uh, by the way, there was a study that found out that countries, the the you know America and and the UK and such are a hundred times more likely to get involved in a conflict in a country if that country has oil, a <laughs> hundred times more likely. Um, so so that's one. Number two is uh, 
outside of our central banking mechanism or threatening to drop the dollar or the petrodollar. So uh, Saddam Hussein dropped the dollar, Syria dropped the dollar, uh, Libya was threatening to drop the dollar and create a gold uh, African currency. Um, so uh, Venezuela dropped the dollar. So these countries that are not in our sphere of economic influence via the dollar is very dangerous for us. And so we, we worry that it will impact our economic power. And uh, that's another reason the U.S. gets involved. And the third one, which is perhaps, a, you know, depending, sometimes lesser reason, uh, just has to do with socialism. If a country is more socialist, then we worry that that will spread, that the people will want more equality in terms of the, the massive amount of money that's being extracted to the top, to the tiny 1%. And uh, that, so that's another strike against Venezuela. That's why we have the embargo on Cuba and we've hated them for so many decades. Uh, Noam Chomsky calls it the, exa the, the threat of the good example. If people see a socialist com country doing well, and by the way, uh, before our sanctions on Venezuela really took hold, uh, Chavez cut poverty by 50% and extreme poverty by 70%, uh, brought in free healthcare, free university, and so much more. So if the, 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 corp the corporate interests are worried that if people see a success in a, a socialist country, that uh, that will cause some sort of uprising and, and people will want more equality on that front. Uh, so I think between those three things, do you generally s see the reasoning behind uh, most of our invasions? Right, which is why, again, WikiLeaks and Julian Assange are such an important beacon of mm -hmm. uh, moral authority, but also the way forward for mankind. The way forward for mankind is truth. The way forward for mankind is to have a very educated and healthy population. And don't get me started on the culling of the mankind through all the various uh, skullduggery they've got making people sick. Um, but I, I, I just, I'd love to know what you think WikiLeaks actually performs beyond just exposing crime, whether you feel that they, they have a deeply important role in the in the quest of man evolving? Well, I think, as you're saying, I think the future is cooperation. It is working between people. Uh, it is not allowing our nations, our national borders to divide us as human beings, not allowing uh, propaganda that's put forward to divide us and realize that we have more in common with each other than we do with a, a tiny number of immensely rich that kind of rule our governments. We have more in common with each other. We, so it should be about cooperation. And I think what WikiLeaks does to further that is if you look, as you said, the, the stuff they revealed is not just about America, it's about many countries and the uh, secretive actions that they take the, um, the act, actions to remain in control, to control their own populations, and really what that information should show your average Americans, your average Brits, your average French. It should show us that we are basically in a battle against uh, uh, secretive governments that are ruling over us rather than a battle against each other. Um, you know, I have no, if, if a Syrian person were sitting next to me right now, should I, you know, want to kill them because of all the propaganda I've heard about Syria? It's, <laughs> it's insane. It, it, it totally makes no sense. We have far more in common with each other than we do differences. And it's the job of our mainstream media, which our mainstream media is basically the anti-WikiLeaks. It's, it's their job right. to make sure we don't know. <laughs> About the true information we don't know about the, our our similarities and our connections as human beings and instead we focus on this nation's doing this this nation's doing that i mean every day on the tvs here in america is about china's doing this russia's doing this iran's doing this and so it's like why are we told to hate these peoples instead of being told about how similar we are and how much we should be working together to fix uh, you know the environmental uh, collapse that is 
happening right now on this planet. We've lost 50% of all wildlife over the past 40 years. And, you know, the, the, the bees and the insects are mm. disappearing at an astronomical rate. And we think we're going to solve it through war. It's, it's laughable. Well, it's also terrifying because clearly the people whose who's, um, ability is to take power are those least fit to have power. So that's something that we as a population of the planet, we need to figure that out. We need to figure out how we, I mean, I was saying this uh, at some other conversation I was having, um, you know, we need an actual psychological profile done on anyone who wants to run for office or indeed any, you know, um, position of authority. I just want a sociopathy. I just want a sociopathy test for everybody in government. <laughs> Probably come out absolutely terrifying. Uh, yeah. But, you know, it, I, I, I think if they're all sociopaths, which they probably are, they're going to come out sounding squeaky clean. That's what they're good at. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I think for my, for my hope anyway, um, and we've only got like five more minutes, I would love you to, because that was brilliant what you just said, for oh, us thanks. to know what, yeah, for, for us to understand our similarities and our connection and the community that we have as human beings. Um, is so real and in fact a perfect example was in the first world war when it was christmas you know this story right oh yeah and, yeah. and the germans the germans started singing christmas carols and then they went oh fuck this war and they like came out and met in <laughs> no man's land and they played football and they sang and everything you know that's that's real human beings i think war is a terrible aberration of uh, of madness um i think you know I certainly know that people need to be warriors, right? We need warriors. We can't do without that because sometimes there are nutters and we have to be able to kind of fend people off. But um, I'd love to know if you were to speak now to Julian, what you would say to encourage him and make him understand how much he's contributed to our world. I'd love you to end on that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, I think he should just understand that there's so many of us out here who appreciate what he started, what he began, and I'm sure at his darkest moments, it feels like it, uh, you know, hasn't achieved enough or that it wasn't worth it. Um, you know, if those doubts ever creep into his head, I hope he will know that that's uh, not true and that you know, I, I listed them before, but there's so much in this world that wouldn't have happened. And, and when I say, you know, things like Occupy wouldn't have happened, and maybe it's easy for some people to go, oh, well, it didn't work anyway. But in fact, the ripples of Occupy continue throughout our society. The way people speak about uh, economics and, and speak about the 99% and the 1% and, and, and speak about equality and justice, it's like some of that was was a, a fire was lit under that by the Occupy movement. So, uh, you know, the, the, the ways that these ripples keep coursing through our society are, are huge and we shouldn't uh, forget that or downgrade that. And so I, I would just want to let him know that his, his impact has been massive already. And there are so many of us that uh, support his cause and, you know, no matter where it goes from here, no matter how tough it may get, uh, there's just there's millions of people out here that are continuing to fight for freedom of information, freedom of press, and of course, his personal physical freedom. Uh, brilliant and well said. And actually, um, I don't think, sorry, I've got to find my phone. I don't think our next guest is here. So please stay with me. Um, okay. I've, I've lost my uh, phone. <laughs> hang on a sec. Um, Actually, no hang worries. on one sec. No, I'm, no, please. Uh, I'm, I'm sure the CIA will know where your phone is. You can ask them. <laughs> ask who's the next guest. Yeah, I'm just going to see. Hang on a sec. Uh, so, you know what? I am going to let you carry on. Okay. Um, I am just... I think my dog is sitting on my phone and that's why I can't figure out who's the next person. Um, <laughs> well, that, that is what they say. Uh, you know, whenever you're having a secret meeting that you don't want the NSA to be spying on, just put the phone under your dog. So just, <laughs> use, just use the dog to hide the phone. Just radiate the dog. Yeah, um, this is really weird. I just don't know what happened to it. Anyway, look, I, Joe, 
if you're listening, can you just let me know when the next guest comes? And I will, if you're, if you're happy to keep talking, uh, Lee, otherwise, oh, oh here we go. All right, brilliant. So Lee, are you happy to stick with me? Sure, I can do a, a few more minutes. Thank you. Um, well, then let, let tell me, me can I freedom? Can, can, well, I was gonna, I was gonna turn you into the guest for a second. I was wondering if you could oh. talk about uh, how it was you first got involved with, uh, you know, caring about WikiLeaks and and kind of uh, doing things like this, uh, supporting uh, Julian and the cause. Uh, I actually, uh, I can't remember exactly what it was, but I remember. Um, okay, so everyone's going to have a shit fit now, but I started listening to Alex Jones like back in 2005 <laughs> and uh, so I know everyone hates Alex, but I actually love him. I know he's bonkers, but he actually was the reason why I woke up and a lot of the things that he speaks about are real and are something to be very deeply concerned about. Everything that may be a personal failings of his, I embrace because he's done so much to try and wake people up. So that said, I was, uh, I think I was watching something and he was talking about WikiLeaks and something that they had um, released. So I went on WikiLeaks site and they had a notice, a banner or something saying, please download all of these documents to protect them. And uh, I was very excited by this. I thought, oh my God, you know, I can help. I can, but you know, Tor was such a bloody confusion to me. And I did try and I think I downloaded some of the documents, but I was very excited by this group that were actually protecting very, very important documentation of crimes. And I, I thought it was beautiful that they said to everyone, look, can you just download all this stuff so that if we have it taken away from us, we know that, you know, a million people have all downloaded it already. So it's not a problem. So I was very excited by this thing. And then I started like, um, I don't know, just sort of um, watching the things that they came up with. Um, that were revelations because they were such extraordinary. Um, I mean, it, it just jettisoned the conversation into something real. You know, the conversation that you hear on any geopolitical programs or, or mainstream media is just waffling bollocks, most of it. So it, yeah. it just jettisoned, it jettisoned conversation to something real. And I love that. And then I listened to Julian make some of his amazing speeches. And I just thought, God almighty, this man has balls and he's speaking the truth, you know, and I, you know, I'm sorry if everyone's going to start like, you know, going green in the face when I keep saying about this, about Jesus Christ. But the, the analogy that I'm trying to give about Julian is that he has performed exactly a similar revelation. He's raised people's consciousness and awareness like Jesus did, you know, and 2000 years ago, you know, we were throwing rocks at women when they, you know, committed adultery. So, you know, it was what I could see you want to say something. Oh, no, I, I was enjoying listening. Uh, I, I was going to say uh, that I think you're saying a lot of interesting things. But what, what it made me think of is, you know, you and I are very different people, uh, you know, from from different pasts and, uh, you know, uh, feel differently about things like uh, Jesus or Alex Jones. But right. <laughs> Despite all of that, what we can agree on, and I think what people watching, no matter which side or opinions they're having on various things, is freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of these documents. Uh, it, it, it actually goes to show the power.
when you said that if you had a Syrian man sitting next to you, you would realize how much you share and how much similarities you have. Well, welcome to America. Welcome to me supporting Trump. I don't know who he is or whether he's a good person. I support some of the things he does. I support anything that's a good thing. But the test of Americans really, really realizing the similarities, like you and I share goals. We share the goal of truth. We may have different opinions about certain things. I may have a different way of explaining stuff. But for instance, the kind of, you know, getting your nose out of joint because of something that somebody says like you know truthfully it kind of gets my nose out of joint if people really really run down alex jones because i don't think they listen to him enough yes i know he's a pretty outrageous creature but i listen to him and um i think what i want people to learn is exactly what you described about that knowing that we share similarities to Chinese people and Syrian people, and they have different religions, they have different ideas of everything, but we're human beings. You and I share goals. And I'm sure that if we were, you know, sort of locked on an island, we'd have disputes about one thing or another, but basically we share the belief in, in, in being good to each other. And, um, I, I, I encourage everyone, because it's hard, I know it's hard, to allow yourself to be with fellow Americans, to watch other programs, to watch, you know, and listen to what people feel that's different from what you feel. Otherwise, we're never going to come together. Because remember what you said, is that if we're going to be mankind, we're going to have to dissolve this idea that there are you know, those people over there who are different from us and we don't like them. We're going to have to resolve that as a spiritual, you know, evolutionary step as mankind. Otherwise, we are going to stay in this diabolical nightmare of because you, I, you, I don't agree with you. I'm going to say, fuck off, you bastard. <laughs> you know, like that's moronic. That is right. absolutely moronic. What we instead need to do is kind of that. I remember years ago on British TV, there would be these um, debates. And, you know, the British are so sort of like, now hang on a second, let him say his thing. You know, so it's all very sort of like everyone must have a, a say. And I love that. I love the fact that people would get all hot under the collar, but they remained respectful of the fact that this was a discussion. This was an exploration, an exploration of getting to know somebody else and what they think. And God forbid that you should actually change your viewpoint as a result of hearing them. And um, so I, you know, I know that it's important that we don't get political on this because this is this is the whole point. Loving and defending Julian Assange, loving and defending WikiLeaks and what it represents to mankind is why we're here. And the differences that we may have in opinion, I just want us to be free to say it to each other and not fear that you're going to dislike me. I would like instead for you to go, wow, I need to straighten this woman's head out. You know, I need to tell her about, you know, socialism and how brilliant it is. You know, I don't like socialism uh, because I fear it. I think that whenever I've seen, you know, it, socialism in England, it's turned into an, an, a nightmare. Now, let me give you an interesting other alternate viewpoint. So my father was an artist and most artists don't work for years on end because they're fussing about trying to invent something or think of something. So whatever money a film director may make, they're living off that. And at one point, my father thought he would have to leave England because the taxation went up to 86%. And uh, that was during a Labour government. And so what people don't understand is that people who are entrepreneurs or artists, they need capital to function. And somehow we have to find a way of not having crony capitalism, right? And not have injustice. And I think that we should free ourselves from political um, systems and we should just talk to each other and find out what we want and what we need and that we fight with each other to get those things. And that to understand that, sorry, I'm going off on one, but no, that's, that's what, okay. what, 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 what I was going to say is, well, I, I, I hear your, what you're saying, and, but what I was saying earlier was not, was not uh, to 
try and uh, you know convince people that socialism is the best system or anything. I was just going through the reasons that the U.S. upends governments, and one of them is absolutely connected to to uh, socialist governments and the the uh, fear of loss of control. Now, whether you love socialism or hate is hate it, uh, I think we should be for a government or a uh, a nation to uh, have self determination to decide themselves, the people, what they want. And so for us to try and tear down uh, a people just because they have an economic system or a government that we uh, you know, don't think is the best way for them to run their country, that's what I don't like. I don't like uh, taking self-determination away from others. Right, and nobody likes that. It's nutcases that like that. It's <laughs> crazy people that like that. And our problem is how are we going to you know, get crazy people and corrupt people and spineless people out of government. Well, it seems to me that the number one thing we should do, again, my reason for not loving socialism, I think we need to decentralize. I think we need to make community police, not great big, you know, federal police departments yeah, like the FBI, absolutely. which has proven it. You know, we need to decentralize. Yeah. And I think that that is the reason why we are dumbed down you know that deliberate dumbing down of America? Have you seen that, Charlotte Isabel? Uh, no. Oh, my God. You have got to look at that. Charlotte Isabel worked in Reagan's um, uh, education uh, department, and she discovered and unearthed this entire terrifying change agent, change agenting going on where the whole education system was being deliberately dumbed down. And I'd hardly need to point out that the education system is pretty dreadful in America. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, I think uh, uh, you are so sweet to stay with me. I don't know where but I, Nico's missing in action here. I got a little I've message got, I, saying. I've well, got about five more minutes before I have to head uh, out. But well, I'm, then that's I'm, fine I'm, because I, I totally, totally. No, 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 you're completely sweet to stay this long. I believe it or not. I think I can chatter along on my own. Uh, but, <laughs> Um, as you are going to leave in five minutes, is there anything that you feel that hasn't been talked about, about Julian or WikiLeaks, that is specifically something that you found inspiring about him and why he's so important that we stand by him? Well, I, I think it was, I mean, he's, <laughs> I think what's impressive about WikiLeaks is it's not, it's not just a quest for revealing the truth. It's also, I mean, they're, they're also kind of inventors. They invented a, a system to allow truth tellers to come forward anonymously. And that's another thing people should realize. I think some people who are uninformed on this think that WikiLeaks outed, uh, you know, certain whistleblowers or somehow outed Chelsea Manning or something. But the, the truth is any, any whistleblowers through WikiLeaks that have been revealed have uh, revealed themselves to others. It was not WikiLeaks mm -hmm. doing it. So they have, you know, they invented a system that allows for uh, any individual who has information to to bring it forward if it's useful uh, to the population to know these things. And and so I think on the inventing level of it, it's also impressive. It's not the quest for truth is 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 not just uh, a, something that that is should be should be respected but um i also think that more than ever the idea of wikileaks and whistleblowers should be even more important because we're seeing such large-scale censorship on these social media platforms um on facebook on twitter uh and they're conspiring together you know the the day that uh, 800 pages were purged from facebook they also banned the twitter accounts of many of the editors of those pages and people that were connected to them so that means facebook and twitter got together said which pages need to be suppressed and you know some of these were things like anti-media free thought project police the police uh very serious organizations that spend a lot of time and effort uh, working to to create uh, these journalistic enterprises and they're just crushed and and you know i myself have been 
uh, shadow capped at 335,000 followers on Facebook for the past two years. They'll never, even though I used to gain 6,000 a week, I'm not allowed to get above that now. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a, a, a massive level of suppression and censorship that's going on. And WikiLeaks is an organization that stands outside of that and has not tried to uh, uh, suppress content. So uh, I think they're, they're more important than ever. Of course, they're up against more, um, you know, people and entities trying to stop them than ever. So uh, there is that. But as the last guest who was, who was on uh, before we started, he Patrick, said that, yeah, yeah, that truth can, truth can go viral so quick. And so stopping the truth is, is a very difficult pursuit. Um, we're mm -hmm. in pivotal times. And I think that the, the, the revelations of what really, really is going on in our world, uh, kind of can't be stopped if if they uh, just get a little a little finger hold a little toe hold in there they, they really can't be stopped so uh, you know I have a lot of hope for the information revolution continuing despite all the censorship that was brilliant because I'll tell you I haven't heard one guest make that point about WikiLeaks literally inventing yeah. a new platform that that was you're so right about that they are innovators innovators mm -hmm. of news innovators of uh, civilization, you know, and they're protectors of civilization. So yeah, that was a brilliant ending point. You have been so thanks. generous to stay oh, this long. Thank you. thank you so much, Lee. And, and, thanks, and, and for, thanks for having me and for doing what you oh do. My, oh my God, it, thank you. <laughs>